Chapter 1 Extraordinary Murders I was staying in Paris during the spring and part of the summer of 18... There I met a Monsieur C. Auguste Dupin. This young gentleman came from a noble family, but he himself was not very rich. He was not really interested in money. He lived frugally. Books were his only luxury. We first met at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre. By some strange coincidence, we were both looking for the same book. After that, we met many more times. He told me about the history of his family. I was astonished by the extent of his reading. When did he find the time to read so many books? And I was fascinated by his vivid imagination. It was decided that we should live together while I was in Paris. We found a big old deserted house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. As I had more money than Dupin, I offered to pay the rent. Our isolation was perfect. We admitted no visitors. Nobody knew the address of the house where we lived. For some strange reason, Dupin loved the night, and I began to share his enthusiasm. Of course, the night did not last forever, so when the morning came, we closed all the shutters on the building to simulate the conditions of darkness. Then we lit two or three candles. This was to have enough light to read or write or simply talk. We sat in the house all day until the clock indicated that the true night was coming. Then we went out into the streets, continuing our conversation. We walked far and wide in the great city, looking for things to stimulate our imagination. There was an infinity of mental excitement in simply observing the world. It was during these walks that I discovered and began to admire Dupin's incredible analytic ability. He told me that he could see directly into men's hearts and minds. At first I did not believe him, but then something happened to change my mind. One night we were walking down a long, dirty street near the Palais Royal. I was looking at a newspaper when I noticed one particular story. Extraordinary Murders This morning at about three o'clock, a number of terrible screams awoke the inhabitants of the Quartier Saint-Roche. The screams were coming from the fourth floor of a house in the Rue Morgue. Only two people lived there, Madame L'Espanay and her daughter, Mademoiselle Camille L'Espanay. After several attempts, neighbours finally entered the house together with two policemen. By this time, there were no more screams. But as the group ran up the stairs, they heard two more angry voices coming from the upper part of the house. However, when they got to the fourth floor, there was again silence. They divided up into small groups, moving from room to room. They finally arrived at a back room. The scene they discovered there was almost too horrible to describe. The apartment was in great disorder. The furniture was broken, and the bed lay in the middle of the floor. On a chair was a razor covered in blood. Bloody lengths of human hair lay in the fireplace. On the floor there were three large silver spoons, an earring, and two bags containing four thousand francs in gold. The drawers of a desk which stood in one corner were open, and papers were scattered about. Under the bed was an open safe with the key still in the door. 
It contained a few letters and other papers, but nothing of any importance. There was no sign of Madame Lespanet, but somebody noticed there was an extraordinary quantity of soot in the fireplace, and so they searched the chimney. There they found the dead body of the daughter. The body was quite warm. A doctor examined it and found many bruises and cuts. On the throat there were several dark bruises and finger marks. This suggested only one thing: strangulation. They searched the rest of the house, but found nothing. Finally, they went into the small garden at the back of the house. There, they found the body of the old lady. Her throat was completely cut, and when two men tried to raise her, the head fell off. The body itself. Was completely mutilated. It didn't look human. No one has yet found a clue that could help to solve this mystery. Chapter Two: The Testimonies. The next day's paper had the following additional details: the tragedy of the Rue Morgue. Police have questioned many individuals about this horrible incident. The truth behind the murders, however, still remains a mystery. Below, we have printed the testimonies of the neighbors and witnesses. Pauline Dubois, Madame Lespanet's laundress, says that she has known both the victims for three years. The old lady and her daughter seem to have a good relationship. They were very affectionate to each other. They paid her very well. She didn't know what Madame Lespanet's job was. She never met anyone in the house when she came for the washing. They didn't have a servant. There was no furniture in the building apart from that in the fourth floor apartment where they lived. Pierre Moreau, tobacconist, says that he has sold tobacco to Madame Lespanet for almost four years. He was born in the area and has always lived there. The victims moved to the house six years ago. The two of them lived a very quiet life. He believed they had money. The only people who entered the house were the old lady and her daughter, a porter once or twice, and a doctor eight or ten times. Other neighbors said similar things. There were never any visitors to the house. Nobody knew if Madame Lespanet had any relatives. The shutters of the front windows were usually closed, and those on the windows at the back of the house were always closed, with one exception: the large room at the back on the fourth floor. It was a good house and wasn't very old. Isidore Mousset, policeman. Says that someone called him and told him to go to the house. There he found about twenty or thirty people at the gates. They were trying to get in. He opened the gates easily with a piece of metal. The screams continued until the gates were open. Then they stopped. They seemed to be screams of a person or people in great agony. They were loud and long. The party went upstairs. From the first floor, they could hear two voices. They seemed to be arguing. One was quite low, the other much higher, a very strange voice. The first voice was that of a Frenchman, not a woman. The other voice was that of a foreigner, but he could not tell if it was a man or a woman. He thought the language was Spanish. But Mr. Mousset does not speak Spanish himself. Henri Duval, a neighbor, says that he was one of the party who first entered the house. In general, he agrees with the testimony of Mousset, but he thinks that the high voice was that of an Italian, although he does not speak Italian.
he is certain it was not French. He could not be sure that it was a man's voice, possibly a woman. He knew Madame L'Espanay and her daughter. He was sure that the high voice did not belong to either of them. Monsieur Odenheimer, restaurant owner, comes from Amsterdam and does not speak French. He was passing the house when he heard the screams. They lasted for about ten minutes. He was one of those who entered the building, but he was sure that the high voice was that of a man, a Frenchman. He didn't know what it was saying. The words were loud and quick, spoken in fear and some anger. The voice was harsh. The low voice said several times. Heaven help us! And once, my God. Jules Le Mignot, banker, says that Madame L'Espanay had some property. She had an account with his bank. She made frequent deposits in small sums. Three days before her death, she took out the sum of four thousand francs. The bank paid her the sum in gold and sent a clerk to her house with the money. Adolf Lebon, clerk to Mignot and Son, says that at twelve noon he accompanied Madame L'Espanay to her house with the four thousand francs in two bags. He did not see anyone in the street at that time. William Bird, tailor, is an Englishman. He has lived in Paris for two years. He was one of the first to go up the stairs. He heard the voices and also a sound like the sound of people fighting. The shrill voice was very loud. He believes it was German, although he does not speak the language. Perhaps the voice of a woman. Four of the above-named witnesses also said that the door of the room where they found the body of Mademoiselle Lespanet was locked from the inside. Everything was perfectly silent. When they opened the door, there was nobody there. The windows of both the back and front room were closed and locked from inside. A door between the two rooms was closed, but not locked. The door from the front room into the corridor was locked with the key on the inside. A small room in the front of the house, at the end of the corridor, was open. This room was full of old beds and boxes. The police searched the whole house. Some of the witnesses say that only three minutes passed between the time they heard the angry voices and the moment they forced the door of the room. Others think the interval was as long as five minutes. Alfonso Garcia, undertaker, says that he lives in the Rue Morgue. He was one of the party who entered the house, but he did not go upstairs. He was too afraid. He heard the voices arguing, but he could not hear what they said. The low voice was that of a Frenchman. The high voice was an Englishman. He is sure of this, although he does not understand English. Alberto Montani, baker, says he was one of the first to go upstairs. He heard the voices clearly. The low voice was that of a Frenchman. He thinks that the shrill voice was speaking Russian. He has never spoken to anyone from Russia. Several witnesses. Said that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth floor were too small for a human being to enter them. The apartment had no back door for a killer to make his escape while the party were coming up the stairs. The body of Mademoiselle Lespanet was so firmly pushed up the chimney that it took four or five of the party to remove it. Paul Dumas, doctor. Says that he saw the bodies in the early morning. 
They were both lying in the room where the daughter was found. The young lady's body was covered in cuts and bruises. The throat was greatly marked. The face was discoloured, and the tongue was partially bitten through. According to Monsieur Dumas, the girl's death was the result of strangulation. The body of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right arm were broken. The whole body was badly bruised and discoloured. It was not possible to say what the cause of these injuries was. Possibly a heavy wooden club, or an iron bar, or a chair. Any large, heavy object could produce these results in the hands of a powerful man. But it would be impossible for a woman. The head of the old lady was separate from the body. Her throat was cut, probably with a razor. This is the strangest murder case that Paris has ever seen. As usual, the police know nothing, but there is not one single clue to help them. Chapter Three. At the scene of the crime, the story of the murders in the Rue Morgue continued in the evening edition of the newspaper. It says here that the police have arrested and imprisoned Adolphe Lebon, the clerk from the bank. I said, "The Parisian police are clever, but no more than that." Dupin replied, "There is no method in the way they work, other than the method of the moment." The results they get are surprising, but most of the time they are obtained simply thanks to diligence and hard work. But when these qualities are not enough, their strategies fail. Vidoc, for example, was a good policeman, but he always made the same mistake. His investigations were always too intense. He couldn't see clearly because he held the object too close. Perhaps he saw one or two details clearly, but in doing this, he couldn't see the object as a whole. It is possible for an investigation to be too profound. The truth is not always at the bottom of a well. <laughs> in fact, I believe that the truth is often at the surface of things. As for these murders, Dupin continued, we will go and see the house with our own eyes. I know the police commissioner. It will not be difficult to obtain permission. Dupin obtained permission, and we went immediately to the Rue Morgue. It was late in the afternoon when we arrived at the house. It was an ordinary Parisian house. Before we went inside, we walked around the building. Dupin examined the whole area with great attention. Then we entered the house. We went upstairs to the room where they had found the body of Mademoiselle Lespanet. To my surprise, the bodies of the two women were still there. Dupin examined everything, including the dead bodies. We then went into the other rooms, accompanied by a policeman. We stayed in the house until it began to get dark. Then we began the journey home. On the way home, Dupin stopped for a moment to visit the offices of one of the daily newspapers. My companion did not speak about the murders again until about noon the next day. Did you notice anything peculiar at the scene of the murders? He asked me. No, nothing peculiar. I said, "Only the things I read about in the newspaper." The newspapers know nothing," he declared. "It seems to me that they consider this case insoluble, for the very reason that renders it easy to solve. I mean the bizarre character of the murders. The police cannot understand the fact that there is no obvious motive for the atrocity of the murders." They are also confused by the angry voices because there was no one upstairs apart from the body of Mademoiselle Lespanet, and there was no way to leave the building.